If you'd asked about scientific studies of empathy, compassion, love, 40 years ago, you might have gotten a different answer. But now, given that we understand that these are some of the most powerful human capacities, empathy, love, perspective taking, different forms of compassion, Now, these are actually really well accepted as the purview of um, scientific investigation. What we can unearth really depends on the tools and the methods we use. But there's a huge interest because these are powerful drivers of behavior, of motivation, and social interactions. And so people have, scientists are incredibly interested. So compassion cultivation training um, was inspired by uh, Thupten Jimpa, um, who came to Stanford uh, and for like a fellowship and spent some time with us or in residence. And one of the projects was to develop a compassion training program to identify a sequence of compassion practices, not the full range, but just a few, and put it into an eight-week package. It started with nine weeks, we reduced it to eight. And to mimic or the mindfulness-based stress reduction, but in this case, with, the, with a sequence of compassion practices towards others, towards a friend, enemy, stranger, towards yourself, universal compassion towards all living beings, and then uh, Tonglen, taking on suffering, giving uh, well-being to others, as a sequence to introduce people to uh, a few of the compassion practices that currently exist. And that was done at Stanford University. And then we had the great, there was like five or six of us that sat um, for several weeks putting this together and codifying it. And then we did a couple of research studies on that practice. And now there's a Compassion Institute that trains teachers in the Compassion Cultivation Program, eight weeks long, and are trying to um, offer this all over the world. And it's a good complement to the mindfulness-based stress reduction in that the cult of the, trying to cultivate compassion really helps people think about others. It's relational, whereas lots of the mindfulness practices, uh, especially as done in the West, are very, about, very intra-psychic. It's about me um, and not necessarily always other-oriented. So it's a very nice complement um, to current mindfulness training. One of my favorite tools to develop compassion on a, both conceptual and a visceral level. Um, and I try to do this with others um, to train people in this, is to have people in dyads, couples, facing each other. And then I guide them in a practice that's like called Just Like Me, which is a combination of loving kindness meditation plus guided statements with another human being, where you think about other people you look at them, and then you also stop looking and go inside, and then you look at them again, and you go inside. So you have this intermittent um, connecting, retreating, and step by step, you think about, you know, this person's heart had their heart broken. This person has felt deep despair and sadness, just like me. This person wants to lead a meaningful life, to be appreciated, to be respected, to be loved, just like me. So what you do is you think about the other, you relate it back to your own experience, like a dance, a coupled dance, back and forth again and again, and you can take people pretty deep. And then you, you see the other, and then you stop seeing the other. You see the other, and you stop seeing. And this practice uh, can be incredibly powerful in um, developing equanimity, even a sense of love for the other person, and a sense of caring and compassion, and a, clearly in a sense of connection. One of the variations is that at some point at, towards the end, you can actually put yourself or imagine yourself in front of yourself and saying, this person, me, in front of me, wishes to be respected, to be loved. We'll have moments of depression, anxiety, angst, just like me. So to bring in that very <laughs> important relationship, is, which is oneself with oneself, which is often neglected. We hardly ever get any education about that. 
And where do we spend most of our time? In our own mind with ourselves. There's so much fragmentation and loneliness, and compassion is a real antidote to that. And there's so much pressure when we think about, I need to be fill in the dot more powerful, more skillful, more beautiful, more intelligent, more blah, blah, blah. And it's so much emphasis on the, the individual in isolation. The compassion practices are the antithesis of that. I exist in relation to others. The quality of my well-being and is in relation to others. Really, it's the 180-degree flip. What would the world be like if we had more compassion practices? We've actually raised that question, like just even in organization, like when we brought Search Inside Yourself or compassion cultivation or other things into a specific group. What would it be like if where you work now, maybe it's 50 people, maybe it's 500 people, if over a year you did this practice of connecting with this person in silence, intimately, genuinely, I'm sure that every single time you walked through the door and saw that person, you would have a very different automatic empathic resonance with that person that is probably measurable in the brain. You know, like, you know, syn synchrony of brain firing patterns. <clears throat> people would feel less isolated. People might be a little bit more kind with each other. And uh, people might be a little bit less harmful, and maybe a little bit less social comparison with each other. Developing compassion uh, does, can start on an individual basis, and it doesn't even have to be with a human being. In fact, one thing we learned is that for many people, trying to generate like love and care for a pet is often much easier than a human being because of past traumatic experiences or insecure attachment or um, uncomfortable learning experiences. So, but, but for some people to extend that, that sense of care and love for all beings, or compassion for all beings, can be daunting. So, so in that case, maybe you begin with somebody who is, is a, a real person or a partner. Um, and then it's not also just in the present. We can also think about generating care and compassion for people past, present, and even the future. Right? When we think about climate change, when we think about uh, the animals that will be born, the human beings that will be born, out of compassion for them, out of care for the causes and conditions that bring suffering to, for them, I want to mount, to cultivate um, an energy to take action for them. We know that sometimes it's easier to generate compassion for one being and then to try to amplify that. I think one good lit litmus test, if I can use that phrase, which, which, which is actually an important thing. If you walk down the street and you see somebody who has a broken leg, when we see somebody who clearly doesn't look like they're well, right? be it a physical injury or mental problems, sometimes we can have a very spontaneous and authentic sense of oh, caring and compassion for that person. To really get a sense that my, my compassion is, is stable and spreading, it would be to recognize that even the person who looks like they have everything together, that's well, no visible signs of suffering or pain or angst, to generate compassion even for that person, then that begins to um, expand and extend that spontaneous compassion towards more and more people. So you can think of in-group, out-group, all living beings, all animals, all living creatures, past, present, and future. So you can gradually extend further and further out the scope of the compassion and then stabilize it. Um, that's an interesting way to really to do an assessment on oneself. Now what's, my, what's my real compassion level?